Our subject for this evening, the view from above. The view from above. Our theme is Christ in the crisis. Our, mess, our topic for today, the view from above. Well, welcome to Houston International SDA Church, Christ in the Crisis, a series of revival that has been taking place for two days now and will be continuing until the close of this week uh, on Sabbath or Saturday evening when we close the series. We have been blessed uh, to have had uh, our Texas Conference President, Pastor Elder um, Carlos Craig, and uh, yesterday we were blessed to have Pastor Young Justin uh, speaking to us with the words of encouragement during this crisis, where he focused on the need to integrate, need for intergenerational unity and focus in the mission. And as well as we were reminded by Pastor Craig, the need to be reminded even in the midst of the crisis that uh, God still and comes around those who love him. And so for another time tonight, we are so pleased to join with you as uh, our speaker joins us, uh, Pastor Elder Randy Skeet, coming to us all the way from Michigan. Randy Skeet is not new to Houston International. Pastor Randy, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much, Elder Steve. Wonderful. Good to see you. Houston is your family. You have been here before, actually twice. And I believe that uh, this is another opportunity for us to connect with you despite the circumstances. And mm -hmm. we are so happy that you spared the time to join us. Welcome. It's my holy privilege. Thank you very much. Wonderful. And so for our international audience, because we know there are some of you are tuning maybe from South America, from Africa, from Europe. From wherever you are, others join us, joining us through the ABN uh, TV channel, we want to welcome you and uh, ask that you join together with us, gather your family together during this time of revival as we seek Christ in prayer. I'm going to pray, and after I pray, the next voice that you're going to hear is that of uh, Randy Skeet, of course, after being blessed by a special music. Randy Skeet, of course, is an international evangelist, graduate of uh, Oakwood University and uh, Andrews Adventist University, and as well as uh, having served as a director of uh, academic enrichment at the Michigan uh, Medical School. And so we are pleased that you have decided to join us. So join me in prayer as uh, we allow God's spirit to lead us tonight. Let us pray. Our most gracious Father who art in heaven, our King, our Mecca, Lord, Lord of Lords, They told me I, I was like, am I muted? In the dark of the midnight, a 
And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. 
I'm very grateful to God for this glorious privilege, this holy honor, this blessed delight to be with the Houston International Seventh-day Adventist Church for this presentation. We are grateful to God that despite the restrictions forced upon us by the COVID-19 virus, technology permits us to worship this way and actually presents us with a wider field, a larger audience. We can enter countries without documents or passport, and we're grateful to God for that. It is an honor to speak for God, and so I am conscious of the privilege that has been given me from above, and I'm grateful for the brethren at the church who extended the invitation to me. I am particularly pleased to welcome anyone listening who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. You have taken your time to fellowship with us, and I believe I speak for the organizers of this program when I say thank you very much. We are honored by your presence, and may the Lord richly bless you and your family. I say to all children who are watching, little boys and little girls, thank you very much for having an interest in God and Jesus and the Bible. I believe if you listen carefully, my little brothers and my little sisters, God will speak to you and that you will be blessed by his word. Whatever country you're from, may God bless that country, particularly our host country, the United States. May the Lord put them in the mind of our president and those who work with him. The consciousness that in all their decision making, and I pray this for all countries, that they will remember that righteousness exalteth a nation. And if you turn that over, unrighteousness degrades a nation. And so again, I pray that all leaders of all countries that are represented by those listening will remember that righteousness exalteth a nation. By the way, to individualize that verse, righteousness also exalts the individual. Our subject for this evening, the view from above. The view from above. Our theme is Christ in the crisis. Our, mess, our topic for today, the view from above. Before I go any further, I'll ask you to do two favors, particularly. One, while I'm speaking, wherever you are, from time to time, in your heart, simply say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I greatly desire to speak only the words of God. Of God's words, Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. He did not say that about my words. My request that you pray for me is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, and I greatly and urgently desire that God will put his words in my mouth. The second favor I ask is that you think as you listen. Thinking is not as automatic as you may imagine, particularly in churches where so many people come to be entertained. Think as you listen. God requires that you think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And wherever possible, if you can use a physical Bible, I would be most delighted, even though I cannot see. If all you have is a phone, then I understand. But if, don't lose the pleasure of having a physical Bible in your hand, the joy of turning the pages. I realize we are advanced civilization. We have all these gadgets. But sometimes we become too dependent upon gadgets. If you have a physical Bible, I just politely suggest that you use it. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Dear God, thanks for life, not just for mine, but the lives of all those watching this program, wherever they are around this world. Thank you, Father, that to a large degree, we still enjoy freedom of worship. As we assemble now to listen to your word, I ask you today, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that name that conquered death, hell, sin, the grave, and Satan, and sickness, in that name, dear Father, be merciful to us. If we've sinned against you, particularly me, forgive us, dear God. And I ask you, Father, to accept me now as the speaker, as I humble myself before you. I'm as a child, dear God, as Solomon said, I know not how to come in or to go out. And so I fully depend upon you, dear Father, to guide my thinking, Possess my mind 100%. Possess my apparatus of speech, dear God, so that I am literally an instrument in your hand. Bless all those who are listening. 
a special blessing on all the children, dear Father, and a very special blessing on all our guests who are connecting, those who are not Adventists. Now, Father, I commit this service to your glory. Grant us the blessings we need so urgently, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ in the crisis is our theme, our subject for tonight, the view from above. Go with me to Isaiah 55, we shall read from verse 8. Isaiah 55, reading from verse 8, and I read from the King James Version of the Bible. As you read, my friends, read microscopically. Look at what the Bible is saying. Look at it, read it, listen to it, and allow these divine words, these life-changing words to affect your mind. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is telling us he does not think the way we think. But he calls upon us to come as close as we possibly can to think the way he thinks. That is why we have the Bible, which records the life of Christ, the one who perfectly reflected the mind and the character of God. God does not think the way we think. God does not see events the way we see events. We as so-called believers and Christians need to learn to develop the habit of seeing the world through God's eyes. I say again, we must develop the habit of seeing the world, the events of this world, through God's eyes. Because God's viewpoint is the good viewpoint, is the only reliable viewpoint. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man or a woman, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Look at the verse again. There is a way that seemeth right. Everything about it from the human perspective is right, is good, is just. It's upright. But from God's view, it is deadly. And so we need God's viewpoint, which is our topic, the view from above. We are facing this crisis called coronavirus. How? should the child of God view this crisis? And tomorrow I will deal with Christ. Today I'm dealing with the crisis. Tomorrow I'll deal with Christ. Our theme is Christ in the crisis. How shall we view this crisis called the coronavirus or COVID-19? Should we view it the way the world views it or the way the World Health Organization views it or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the National Institute of Health, or any other organization, organization, private or government, that deals with medicine and science and other subjects related to the treatment of disease? My answer to that is no. We cannot take our first view, cannot be the view of the World Health Organization, or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or any other international or national organization. Our view must be a spiritual view. A spiritual view does not negate the other views, epidemiological or whatever other view they may be. It does not negate. It simply becomes the primary viewpoint from which we examine any crisis on this earth. Let me say that again. For the child of God, the biblical or the divine, the God viewpoint, the God perspective, is the perspective we must adopt in order to properly place any crisis within the context of Scripture and the last day events which the Bible talks about. If we see a crisis just the way the world sees the crisis, we are essentially no different from the world and will respond and will react as the world reacts. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, verse 7. This coronavirus, which is a genuine crisis, is not a new crisis. Pandemics and epidemics have blighted this world for the world's uh, duration. Uh, the, 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 perhaps the greatest or the earliest of these great pandemics goes all the way back to 542, 543 uh, in the reign of uh, Justinian, the emperor of Rome with his headquarters at Constantinople. 
A pandemic broke out from about 542, 543, and it ran until the 8th century, almost 225 years this pandemic ran. It is called the Justinian pandemic because it is named after him. You've all heard of the, 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 the bubonic plague or the Black Death that decimated Europe. Experts believe as much as one third of the European population perished. In more recent times, we are familiar with the Spanish flu of 1918, which I believe began on a military base somewhere in Kansas, where it was first detected. Worldwide, estimates are at about 50 million people died in the United States, over 600,000. In 1957, we had an epidemic. In 1968, I believe, we had the Hong Kong flu. In 2009, we had uh, the swine flu. In 57, I believe it was, we had the Asian flu. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, we had something called SARS that affected Southeast Asia and affected, uh, had a great effect on aviation flights going to that part of the world. The world has seen these things, and by the way, will continue to see them. And so if we simply take the view of the world, we will miss what God is trying to say. Why is there a pandemic called coronavirus? Why was there a pandemic called the Justinian plague? Why was there the Spanish flu? Why was there the Hong Kong flu? Why was there the Asian flu? Why was there swine flu? Why was there and is there AIDS that so far since the early 80s, experts believe have taken about or has taken about 32 million lives? There is a reason. And I'll give you the reason as soon as I pray again. Father in heaven, I ask you to continue to exert your power through me that the glory may settle on your name and that we may receive the blessings. Give me simple language in Jesus' name. Amen. The biblical view of any crisis is that it is the result of rebellion against God. Now, let me quickly say, I am not saying everyone affected by the coronavirus it is affected because the person directly sinned. I am not saying that. I am saying we live on a world that is plagued by disease, famine, war, drought, you name it, because of sin. And I pause for that to sink in. The biblical view is sin. Now, the Bible tells us the world is deteriorating. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 10, these are the words of God the Father himself, speaking to the Son, Jesus Christ. And God the Father says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning, and again the Father is addressing Christ. He calls him Lord. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. We know after a while clothes deteriorate, they break down, they become old, and they have to be discarded. The Bible says the world is deteriorating, the world is decaying. And the primary reason why the world is decaying is a spiritual reason or a word that more people will understand, a moral reason. And the reason is this little thing, little in spelling, but gigantic in effect, this thing called sin. Follow me closely. Remove sin. War cease. Disease cease. Disease ceases. Famine no longer occurs. No mudslides. No avalanches. No death. Sin is the reason for one pandemic after another. Sin is the reason for war. Sin is the reason for orphans. Sin is the reason for divorce. Sin is the reason for prisons. Sin is the reason for hospitals. Sin is the reason why they have armies. Sin is the reason why locusts devour crops. Sin is the reason why there are hurricanes and typhoons and, and you name it. Sin is the reason. If you go with me all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, well, let's read from verse chapter 1, verse 31 of Genesis. Genesis 131, our subject, the view from above. We're trying to view this crisis, not from the, uh, the standpoint of the World Health Organization, but we're trying to look at it from heaven's standpoint, and heaven's standpoint is given to us in the Bible. Genesis 131, 
And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Everything God made, and that included light on the first day, the firmament on the second, the separation of water from dry land on the third, along with the creation of vegetation on the fourth day, sun, moon, and stars on the fifth day, uh, the beasts of the, the, the sea, fishes, and the fowls of the air on the sixth day, land animals and humanity. All of this God looked at. All the laws that govern all of nature, every single thing God looked at, and he summarized the two words, very good. There was no sin, no sickness, no calamities, no nothing of the prime. Everything was very good. By the way, this was God's desire for the world if Adam and Eve had obeyed him. I repeat, this was God's desire that the world will continue in this perfect state. But since Adam did not ask to be made, nor Eve, God gave them a test to see if they desired to live in a world that's perfect. And so we go now to chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, reading verse 16, our subject, the view from above. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God issued a warning to Adam and Eve. By the way, God's warnings are expressions of love. He effectively said to them, we can modernize the language and make it practical. You are in a perfect environment, a perfect world. If you want to continue in a perfect world, obey me. Do not eat of that tree. It was a test for perfect people to see where the allegiance lay, whether with God or with themselves or God's great enemy, and we know who that is. The Bible tells us they sinned because of that, because God gave them the consequences, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There is a reality called dying, which is a process that ends in a discrete event, which is death, the immediate cessation of life. Dying ends in death. I hope you understand what I'm saying. There are people right now, they are dying, and it's only a matter of days or weeks before the last breath is taken. Since Adam sinned, this world has been dying. And the dying process takes us to the point of death where the light of life is finally extinguished. It grows dim and dim and dim and dim and is finally extinguished at death. But there's something called dying. And when Adam sinned, the world began to die. According to conservative biblical chronology, that's 6,000 years ago. The world began to die. And as we read in Hebrews 1 from verse 10, the Father speaking to Christ, who is the creator, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, referring to heaven and earth, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as the vestures thou shalt fold them up. The Bible tells us the world and the cosmos connected to this earth are deteriorating, decaying, and will finally be destroyed. Why? The answer is sin. I've said before, I'll say it again, I hope you can understand these words. People don't really die of cancer, they die of sin. If you spend a few seconds thinking of that, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. The Bible gives one reason for death, and that is sin. Now, sickness is an expression of that dying condition in which we live. Disease is an expression of that. Calamities are an expression of a dying world. But fundamentally, biblical, biblically, the view from above is the reason why people die, the, 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 the cause people die of, because of sin. That's biblically. Romans 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Listen again. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. The reason for death is sin. The reason for sickness is sin. And so as we face this crisis, 
The church needs to take a biblical, spiritual, the God view, the divine view, the view from above, and place this crisis in the proper perspective, in the context of uh, fancy word is eschatology or prophecy or end time events. When Christ gave this long discourse on the, the signs of the last days, Matthew 24, we'll go there and we'll read from verse 3 as we continue the view from above. If I go any further, let me pray again. Holy Father in heaven, I really ask you to continue to speak through me. Father, give me the right words, the right thoughts, the right sequence in which to express my thoughts in words. And bless the listeners with understanding. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Matthew 24 from verse 3. The Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus said, he answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus told them, he did not begin by giving them a sign. He told them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Next verse says, For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Christ mentioned that one of the signs of the end will be pestilences, and we have seen them for hundreds of years. This current crisis we're facing the coronavirus, as I said earlier, is the result of a dying world, a world that began to die because of sin. It is also a sign of the end time in which we live, because one of the signs is pestilences. Uh, meteorologists have told us that Hurricanes and typhoons and, and these uh, tornadoes are becoming more and more violent, more destructive as they go as far back as records have been kept uh, about these natural disasters. They're more violent. They come more frequently. They're more intense. Why? Because we are in what the Bible calls the end time when things will become worse and worse. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, Paul tells Timothy, and evil men and seducers shall wax Worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Listen again, 2 Timothy 3.13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The Bible predicts that people will become worse and worse. And as people become worse and worse, there is a concomitant result, and that is conditions in the world become worse and worse. Because as I said earlier, the problem with the world is the problem of sin or a moral problem. And moral problems have their expressions in disasters, in uh, catastrophic human interactions. Sin is the reason why we are facing this calamity. Now, when God destroyed the world by a flood, Let's go back and look at that as we look at the end times of which we live. We look at the crisis. When God destroyed the world by a flood, Second Peter tells us, chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, referring to God's deliverance of Lot, and saved just Lot, or delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. That's Second Peter 2, verse 7. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, <coughs> in seeing and hearing, vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, that's Lot. That's before the flood. We'll get to the flood. That's the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jesus uses both examples as a means for us to understand the last days. You read that in Luke 17, 26 to 30. The lifestyle of those in the days of Lot, Sodom, Gomorrah, Admiral, Zeboim, and Bela, the cities of the plain, was an unlawful lifestyle. In other words, they lived in violation of God's standard of righteousness, God's law, the Ten Commandments. In the days of Noah, Genesis 7, verse 1, listen to what God says of Noah. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now let's think. If God said Noah, 
you are the only righteous family on the earth, then how would you describe the other families that all perished? Unrighteous. If you go to Genesis chapter 6, from verse 1, and it came to pass, <clears throat> to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, Genesis 6, 4, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of all men of renown. Listen to verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This was the condition of the world before God destroyed it by the flood. Listen again to Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. That's how he saw it. Now, the people themselves may have seen a happy life. <clears throat> they may have seen an exciting life with nightclubs and strip joints and alcohol bars and, and cigar bars and uh, whatever else, and peep shows and prostitution and lesbianism and homosexuality and, uh, and pornography. That's probably what they saw. That was a good life. God saw wickedness. And because of that, and they would not repent of the wicked ways, despite the fact that Noah preached 120 years, God wiped out the world with a flood because God cannot continue to tolerate sin, wickedness, unrighteousness, ungodly behavior. And so the world was destroyed by a flood because of the ungodly civilization. Sodom and Gomorrah, on a smaller scale, were destroyed for the very same reason. And the reason is spiritual. Jesus said in Luke 17, 26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all, or took them all. Now, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, verse 28, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Why were the citizens of Lot and the antediluvian people destroyed? Because of sin. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Second Peter 2, well, let's read from verse 4 of Second Peter chapter 2, our subject, the view from above. For if God spared not the angels that sinned and cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to reserve them to judgment. And save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the world, the flood, upon the world of the ungodly. The flood came in upon the world of the ungodly. An ungodly world is an anti-God world. It is an anti-the word of God. It is an anti-the worship of God. It is an anti-Sabbath world. Let me say that again. Second Peter 2 verse 5. Bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The world in Noah's day and in Lot's day was ungodly. Second Peter 2 verse 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with the unlawful deeds. Unlawful, ungodly, same reason. The reason for the catastrophe of the fires of Sodom and Gomorrah, the reason was sin. The reason for the flood, sin. The reason God will destroy this world a second time will be sin. And as we lead up to this uh, global destruction, the reason for suffering on this earth is sin. Now, I'm not discounting the fact that there are people suffering innocently. Yes, that happens. There are people who are sick with, through no cause of their own. I'm not discounting that. But when Adam sinned, we inherited his nature through no cause of our own. The view from above is that this world 
is as ungodly or worse than the world that led to the flood in the days of Noah. This world is as unlawful, as ungodly, and perhaps worse than the world of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboi, Mandela, which led God to, God to destroy them with a conflagration or a fire. In the book, Patriots and Prophets, page 101, paragraph 2, Ella White writes these words. The sins that led to God's vengeance being poured out upon the ancient world, the days of Noah, are present in the world today. The sins that led to God's vengeance upon the antediluvian world are present in the world today. And worse, because 2 Timothy 3 verse 13 tells us, evil men shall wax worse and worse. In Matthew 24, the love of many shall wax cold and wickedness shall increase. We are in a world that, that if God does not destroy this world, he has to apologize to Noah's world and to the world of Lot, Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain. This is the biblical view of the crisis we're facing. The problem of this world is rebellion against God and his standard of righteousness, meaning the Ten Commandments. Now, what I'm saying is not popular. It is not even popular among believers because so much of the world is like the, the church is like the world. I say that again. So much of the church is like the world and the church is so worldlyfied. Let me create a word that the church can no longer see events in the world through the eyes of God. And so the church tends to interpret just like anybody else. COVID-19 is a, a pandemic. Yes, it is. But there's no spiritual view. And when the world sees, the church sees like the world, we have the blind leading the blind, but the world needs a message. The World Health Organization, while it is correct that COVID-19 is a pandemic, it also needs to understand behind this pandemic is something called sin. We live in a world, particularly my country, the United States, where a man can marry a man. That's the world in which we live. We live in a world where a woman can marry a woman. We live in that kind of a world directly opposing uh, the Ten Commandments of God. This is the world in which we live. We live in a world where the Word of God, the Bible, has been thrown out of school, thrown out of wherever. This is the world in which we live, and God cannot sit back and allow that to happen. So in a certain sense, we bring calamities on ourselves. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways. Now listen to how the verse ends. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? Why bring calamity on yourself? Why make things more worse than they actually are by the life you live? So God says, why are you dying? We know the world has to be destroyed, but prior to that final climactic event, an obedient life can result in a blessed life. But the world at large is in darkness of disobedience. John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Let me clarify what I said earlier. I'm not saying everyone infected is infected because he or she committed a sin. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying suffering in the world is the result of sin. But God has a solution for that. And the solution is not just his second return to destroy the world. Before that happens, God has a solution centered in Jesus Christ. And our theme is Christ in the crisis. God has a solution centered in Jesus Christ. And every man or woman who will look to Christ can be spared the final destruction to come. And before that destruction can be preserved by Christ right now. God has a solution and that solution is centered in the person of Jesus Christ. And I will talk more about him tomorrow when I speak about Christ in the crisis. Today, I have suggested to my listeners that the child of God must view this through God's eyes. In John chapter 12, reading from verse 27, John 12, reading from verse 27, I'll pray again, Father in heaven, as I come to the close, continue to be with me, I pray, please, in Jesus' name, amen. In John 12, 27, the Bible says, 
Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said, It thundered. Others said, An angel spake. Jesus answered, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus was addressing an audience, as he always did. The Pharisees were present, as they always were, the scribes, the troublemakers, to catch him in his words. Jesus spoke to the Father from verse 27, uh, 28. He said, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This was a phenomenon of voice from heaven. Some people said it thundered. The voice from heaven must have been loud. Like a thunder sometimes here in Michigan where I live, when the thunder really strikes in the summer, the house shakes. God spoke and said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Some people said thunder just struck. Others said an angel spake. They were both wrong. It was the voice of the Father, as verily as the voice of the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But why am I referring to this event? People heard the sound and misinterpreted the sound. Jesus said he understood the voice was the voice of his Father. He said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sake. Those standing by, including the leaders of that nation, the, the church leaders, the the Pharisees and scribes, they did not properly interpret the sound. Christ is the body of the church. The church is the body of Christ. And in that sense, I was saying the body of Christ on this earth must properly interpret events on the earth. If as Christ properly interpreted that sound, which people call thunder, others call the voice of an angel, when it was actually the voice of God. The view from above. Some said thunder, that's the view from beneath. They were wrong. Some said the voice of the angel, they were wrong. That's the view from, up, from beneath. The view from above was the voice of God. You and I, as believers of God, in God, must have the view from above. The view from above does not mean we do not help. Do all you can to ease the suffering of those affected by the COVID-19 virus. Do everything you can. Wear your mask. Buy a mask for someone who does not have maintain social distancing, avoid large crowds, do all of that because belief in God does not remove common sense. We must obey civil authorities until what they ask us to do violate God's law. If it does not violate, obey civil authorities, wear the mask, social distance, avoid large crowds, whatever is required and recommended to us. But as a child of God, you understand this is a sign of the end. You understand the suffering the world is going through is a spiritual problem, or I may say a moral problem, because the Ten Commandments are a moral law. And this world is in trouble, not because of antiquated medical science. It is in trouble because it is in rebellion against God. And the only way to rebel against God is to rebel against his law. The law that the Bible says represents the whole duty of man. This world is in crisis and has been in crisis since Adam said because it is in rebellion against God. And there needs to be a voice that offers another perspective other than just something originated in China or Spanish flu or German measles or Hong Kong flu or whatever, the flu, Asian flu. There is a, a virus called sin. <laughs> There's a virus called sin, and this virus will lead God to destroy this world. Until then, we must let the world know that in addition to epidemiological approaches, in addition to virology, in addition to vaccinology, in addition to social distancing, the fundamental problem is sin. Because all that we do, if a vaccine is developed, and God delays his coming, another pandemic will come because the problem is sin. We need a vaccine for sin. And we'll talk about that tomorrow because that vaccine is the person of Christ himself. The view from above. The world is in crisis, not because of backward technology, but because of sin. 
not only sin in the world, but sin in the church. This is the reason for the crisis. But again, let me repeat, as children of God, we are to love others regardless of their religious affiliation. The Bible says he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And we must have that attitude to be a blessing to all those who are sick as in so far as we can. But we must not be restricted to the narrow view of the world, which is this is just an epidemiological problem. No, we understand it is an expression of a world in rebellion against God, a world in rebellion against the commandments of God. And as long as that continues, the world will be plagued by one crisis after another until God in his mercy puts an end to this life and introduces a brand new world of which I will hope you will be a part. The view from above, we're dealing with sin, a spiritual crisis, and the solution we'll deal with fully tomorrow is Jesus Christ. And I pray that you, right where you are, without understanding everything, will give your life to Christ. It's not difficult. You simply say, Father, I cannot save myself. I don't understand everything that's happening, but I trust you, and I give my life to you. And I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life. I invite Christ to come. How he comes, leave that up to him. You issue the invitation, leave the rest to Christ. Make sure your invitation is spoken with all your heart. Father, put your spirit, your, the spirit of Christ into my heart now. You pray that prayer, you'll be amazed what God will do. Say that now if you're so convicted so that Christ may begin a work of transformation. For those of us who already know Christ, may we ask God to renew us refresh us with an infilling of his spirit. As a child of God, you and I must take the view from above. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Truth spoken, very Father, is very offensive. In John 6, 66, many disciples left Christ because of what he said. In a world of sin, day, God, truth will always be offensive. But I pray that hearts have received the message, have welcomed the message, dear God, and that lives will change as a result. Let your children reflect on what they've heard and prepare us for tomorrow's message, which looks at the Christ who is in the crisis. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have to view this pandemic from the spiritual mm -hmm. eyes, from mm -hmm. the way God would view it. Mm -hmm. And if truly we do so, we will have comfort, hope, mm -hmm. and confidence as we journey through it, and as we wait for Jesus' soon return. We thank you so much, Pastor, for sharing that with us and encouraging us with those words. And we look forward for tomorrow, coming mm -hmm. back again, tuning in to be able to see the Christ in the crisis. So I welcome everyone again tomorrow, <coughs> tune in at 7 p.m. For now, we'll be favored with another special music. And after that, we wish you a blessed night and hope that you can join us again tomorrow. Thank you so much again for tuning in tonight. May God bless you all. Thank you. The storm howls above me, and there's no hiding place. Me, the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm is over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow of the hand keep me safe till the storm passes by Satan whispered, 
there is no Till the thunder sounds no more Till the clouds roll forever From the sky Hold me fast, let me stand In the hollow of the hand Keep me safe till the storm Oh